Please, Bernabe. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for organizing this and, and inviting me. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, mainly, mainly talking about uh, event-driven convolutions. And uh, I'm going to skip a lot of slides you know, because this is um, longer, for, it's a bit long for 10 minutes, but uh, I'm going to just skip a few. And, uh, well, but I will be, oops, what's happening here? Okay, so this is the outline. I'm going to skip the outline. This is about motivating frames versus events. Uh, I typically talk about uh, Simon one spike per neuron system, but let me skip this as well. This is from Simon Thorpe. No, this is, uh, one spike per neuron processing in the brain for recognition, which it, basically it tells us that uh, information encoding and processing in the brain is highly information and, and energy efficient. No, this is the main message no? because all all the neurons involved in processing they just spike once, one spike per neuron. This is what we want to imitate in hardware. So in hardware try to do address event representation. So here I talk about a little bit about the history and who is using uh, AER or basically all uh, hardware SNNs, they use some kind of AER. And now next, uh, I wanted to give a quick overview about the Caviar project, which is a project that, European project that we had in collaboration with uh, ENI and also with Oslo University and, and some other groups in 2002. And it, it's actually where uh, Toby came up with the first uh, DBS. No? And, and in our group, we came up with the first uh, event-driven convolution chip. So let me just go quickly while this is a web page. And, and here is the, one of the demos that, that we built. The, and, and here we see a recording. So this is the output of the DBS. It's captured with a special board. It is fed to to a convolution system that tracks one one of the of the circles with just doing one convolution with a circular kernel to do plain template matching. Next, it goes to a winner take all that cleans out the output of of the convolution chip, and then this is used to center one of the circles in the center of the screen. So it's it's a closed loop control system, and we had a lot of fun building all these. PCs and PCBs connecting with parallel AER port. And the latency of, of this closed loop was in the range of just a few milliseconds. So it, it was pretty impressive for the big uh, setup that, that we had. So this was um, what Toby actually introduced his, Toby and Patrick and, and Chris introduced the first uh, DBS. Mm. But let me also tell you about our own DBS no, that, that we developed some time later which we added just a little a little tricky circuit which is shown here to to introduce some amplification in in the voltage gain uh, right after the photoreceptor no so it, it's it's a nice and tricky circuit that adds an a gain with a factor n which is the number of diode connected uh, nmos transistors that you have here so in first order it introduces no mismatch, but it introduces a, an important gain. If, if, if you cascade two of these, which is what we did, you get a, an extra gain of n square. And this allows to have this overall gain, which is the, the ratio of the capacitors times n square. In, in, the original, in the original first DBS, they had a gain of 20, C1 over C2, this was the gain. So most of the area went in, in capacitor area, which is this uh, reddish area here. With, with this tricky circuit, we could have a much smaller capacitance ratio and still have a larger gain, like uh, almost one order of magnitude more. So in the same technology, we could build a slightly smaller pixel, but with 10 times better contrast sensitivity. Uh, still, noise was a bit, a little bit above, above the the noise floor, but um, it, it was quite useful. And you can see here in this recording, these are two two DBS cameras of resolution 128 by 128, and and you can see that uh, contrast sensitivity is, is quite nice. And these are uh, plain events; it is not uh, reconstructed uh, frames. So this is this is. Uh, just pure events, no, in in in, in JAR playback, you no, know, the the two the two sensors, and this this was patented and actually licensed to Prophecy, and and, and 
I don't think they ever used it so far because they didn't need it. But uh, in case one day they need to have a much higher contrast, uh, they can use this. The next slide. Okay, so now we go to convolutions. When, when doing event-driven convolution, here is, for example, a, a recording. The, we have an output of a sensor. There is a, a person juggling with three balls, and, and we program the convolution ship with a circular kernel to track the balls. And you can see here the outputs of the convolutions. The way this is done in, 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 the first, uh, in one of the first uh, AER convolution ships that we developed is, is very simple. Every time you get an event coming in from, from the sensor, from, from the sensor, you just uh, project the convolution kernel that you want to compute, you project it around the coordinate of the incoming event. And then you have here an array of integrate and fire neurons and, and by performing all the integrals of, of this uh, uh, if, uh, kernels that you splash around the incoming address, you do it over time and over time you get the convolution in time, in space and time of the input flow. So you get an output flow that represents a convolution event by event. This is um, the, the, the figures here correspond to, to the latest one that we did as, as an ASIC. We could allow an input event throughput that would depend on the size of the kernel. That, that we wanted to store in, in the kernel RAM. We could store up to 32 different kernels and the maximum size of a kernel could be 32 by 32. The input event actually uh, was com is composed of the x, the y coordinate, the sign bit of the input event, plus uh, five other bits to pick the kernel that you wish. So you could store five, five different kernels, and then depending on this five extra bits of the input event, you pick one or the other, no? and they all are integrated on the same on the same um, map or, or the same array of integrated and fire neurons. And for example, this could be used for doing this processing here. This is a very simple uh, processing, illustrating the operation with two kernels. We program two kernels, this diffusive kernel and a Mexican head, which was performing a kind of winner take all competition. And then depending on whether the, kernel, the event was coming from the DBS or from the output itself of the convolution chip, we picked one kernel or the other. So the, the address event was composed of the x, y coordinate and the sign of the events coming from the sensor, plus some hardwired uh, bits for the, for the DBS. And the output was again x, y and the sign and another hardwired five bits to pick the other kernel. So all the events were flowing. And at, at the output, you would have uh, what the DBS was observing, which was a five kilohertz spiral on an, on an old phosphor oscilloscope. Here we can see a 300 microsecond capture. Greens, green dots are the outputs of the DBS and red dots are the output events of the, of the convolution, of the, performing these two convolutions over time. Here we project in, in Y and time, and you can see that there is a very little lag no, in, in computing the, the center of, of, of the cloud. So this one application, uh, uh, another is uh, doing uh, spatial convolution here, for example, is a vertical Gabor filtering. And, and this convolution processing has interesting properties. For example, it filters out temporal noise. And also when you do tracking, it filters out spatial mismatch. Uh, it has forgetting rates, so you also do temporal, uh, temporal filtering. And the very interesting property is pseudo simultaneity, you know, the, because the input and output event flow happens almost simultaneously you know, because you compute the convolution as the events happen. You know? So this input and output capture, they happen for the same 40 microseconds. So you have this pseudo simultaneous property and which scales up uh, over many, over multiple layers. And this is uh, an illustration of uh, doing a, a recognition experiment. You know? we, had, we, we demonstrated that we could do two millisecond re delay recognition, latency recognition. We also did it on Spinnaker. So here we implement uh, different uh, filters on Spinnaker. There was a retinas coming here. We had an interfacing board that it changes the event to SATA format, goes to the Spinnaker board, comes back again in SATA format, and then to JAR for visualization. We use it also for um, uh, stereo vision because in, in stereo vision, by adding convolution, you add another clue for uh, event matching coming from, from two different cameras. So this could be used for matching events from different cameras. And here 
I, I can show you. Uh, this this is actually from Telluride. No, we we had the two camera here, and an object uh, balancing, and this was then recorded and processed offline. This corresponds to an, another recording, not this one. Also, here we were moving a pen in front of the camera, and and we could do uh, stereo vision and, and recognize and, and compute the depth no, of, of the events after matching and so on. And now let me just finish quickly with uh, learning things. Here we used uh, on, on Spinnaker this special temporal back propagation on, 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 on a convolutional neural network. We hacked a little bit the loss function. We added to the standard term, we added another term to optimize, which is the count of events inside the network, ignoring the output events, just the events inside the network, and try to minimize these, uh, depending on a regularization factor. And depending on this regularization factor, we could reduce significantly the average number of events in, in the system. And actually, if we compare this with a classification error, we can see that the optimum was actually for lambda equal 0 0.1, which is around here. So we got uh, the optimum recognition for, for actually low internal activity. And actually the internal activity was about uh, 0.1 Hertz, which is uh, similar to what the brain actually has in, in, in biology. And here are some, some recordings of, of what's happening. This, this was for a fully connected network. And this is for the convolutional neural network, the, the input layer coming from the NMNIST data set and, and the output recognition. Another thing that, that we did was uh, with STDP, we transformed, where well, we used the, instead of using delta T to, to characterize the pre and the post synaptic uh, time difference and at, at the synapse, we used the order. This is something that suggested Simon Thorpe long, long time ago. But we also transformed this to using, to, to restricting to one bit weights, you know, because we, our motivation was to use this for memory registers, so, so, which are in principle constrained to one bit. And in that case, we change the STDP rule to do a probability. If we are inside uh, the window of increasing the weight, we just apply a positive probability to do a full change of the weight from zero to one. And if we are outside, we do a full change from uh, one to zero, depending on, on this probability. And, and this we tested on a system and we got some interesting findings. So here, this was implemented on an FPGA and we implemented two versions, our, our one bit synaptic uh, hardware version and compared it to a conventional STDP based on 8-bit uh, synapses and 8-bit neurons uh, hardware. The horizontal axis is the hardware complexity, the hardware resources. So on, on the same line, for example, for 1-bit, we could have 32 neurons. But for the same hardware complexity in 8-bit, we only could have four neurons. And you can see this blue is the 1-bit STDP. With 32 neurons, more or less, you get uh, maximum accuracy. But for 8-bit neurons, you needed more hardware complexity. You, know? you needed to have uh, 128 neurons. You know? Actually, here I said it wrong. It's not 32. It is 256 neurons. You know? But you need more hardware complexity to, to get the same uh, accuracy. And re regarding uh, spike count, also the 1-bit the system yeah. had much lower. Sorry, Bernabe, we are running in time. Sure, <laughs> yeah, this is actually the, the last slide. So, okay. So, these are the conclusions, and uh, here I can, I can stop. Thank you very much. Okay, we can proceed with the second speaker, uh, Professor Boeing, Quabena. Uh, yeah, hi, David. Let me uh, share my screen uh, for you guys. Um, and then I'll start up the slide presentation. Okay, I'm sharing and let me put up the slides. And let me uh, start my timer. Okay, so yeah, so this is work I did with uh, Sam Folk, <coughs> who graduated two years ago, is now CEO of a startup uh, called Femtosense. And um, the, no, that's, I need to be in this in the right window. Yeah. And so I put these two slides in just for you guys to follow up on the discussion. And so 
just real quick, uh, this is actually from Eric Ruse uh, from Samsung's presentation slide uh, from 2019, where he compares a VGA resolution uh, imager with using a uh, arbiter for the uh, column selection versus a scanner for the column selection. And the point here is that these this arbiter from 2004, my 2004 paper does a breadth first search of the tree, which fixed the problem with an earlier version that was the greedy arbiter that would serve as the same pixel again and again. But in this version of the arbiter, once it serves this pixel or this column, it won't come back to this column until it serves all the other requests in the tree. And this is done by latching the states of the, the daughters of each cell you know, when you make the decision. And, and so in the limit of high throughput, where all these columns are active, the arbiter just goes down, goes up one, goes down, goes up four and goes down. So it, it becomes approximately a scanner, you know? So you can see that here from Eric's, uh, so the maximum throughput is similar as you will see here from measurements. This is nice data from Samsung on those two versions of that VGA arbiter here. And you can see at, you know, out to like, you know, um, giga events per second, they are using this sort of grouping strategy to, to encode more bits, uh, less bits per event. You know, the, the uh, throughput is similar for the uh, word serial AR arbiter in red and the scanner in blue. But you can see in this, for very sparse activity below 6 million events per second, the arbiter, actually, you can't even measure its latency, right? It, the latency is really short here. So it's better. And then it crosses over to where the scanner is better around above 6 million events per second. And it could be three times worse, okay? And this is coming from, you know, it's not exactly a scanner. It may go up one or two levels and before it comes back right down to pick the next, the next guy. So there's a little bit of overhead here. And, um, and so what people have done is, uh, but you know, just to point out the other thing that's also affecting performance here is the generating the column address, right? This is actually in the critical path because we are doing arbitration and then we are selecting a, a column and then we are putting out the address of that column, right? And so this, this, as the number of columns become more, you know, higher resolution, we are driving more capacitance and we are slowing down that process slows. And so these, this design hasn't been able to exceed something like 50 million events per second. And so this is a problem that, you know, as we get to HD resolution, like you see here with Prophecy's uh, latest chip, you know, we, and Samsung has also addressed it similar but different ways. You know, we have to sort of like break that bottleneck introduced by the encoding the column addresses. And so um, what you're seeing here is actually both of these latest chips are 3D. You know, there's two wafers that are stacked. One is a 90 nanometer um, backside emulated uh, CMOS image sensor technology. And the, the backside where you put all your circuitry is in 40 nanometer CMOS. And they've got some nice results and they can read events up to a giga event per second by basically using as little as 1.6 bits to encode each event. And, um, but you can see basically the same architecture going back to that 2004 uh, uh, paper where you, know, you read out these columns in parallel once you select a row, uh, there's no acknowledge per column. Instead, you just acknowledge the row selections that you've got the data and it, it closes the, the timing via the uh, redrawing the, uh, column selection, hey, the row selection. And, you know, this, but, you know, so then the way they get around the bottleneck from encoding the column addresses, they don't do that anymore. They take the parallel data from that row and they pass it through this event signal processing pipeline. And basically they timestamp the data as soon as it comes out that row at one microsecond resolution to basically hide any kind of um, timing and delays and so forth from buffering and processing. And, um, and then they do this sort of clever uh, spatial temporal compression to get it down to 1.6 bits per event. So if you have a 100 megahertz interface, 16 bits, 16 bit parallel, 100 megahertz, 
you can read a, a billion events per second. So that's the state of the art. Now, what we proposed two years ago was that let's move away from this, you know, uh, hacky stuff we've been doing <laughs> since uh, the, the late 90s, where we put all of this circuitry on the periphery. And let's move the circuitry inside the array because the bottleneck really is driving these wired ores or running along sort of the column uh, encoder. And so we propose basically, now this is possible with, with the 3D approach, right? Because your lower chip with all your circuitry, you can now put circuitry where the pixels used to be because the pixels are now on the top die. But none of these uh, Samsung or Prophecies X is using this approach yet. So I just want to let you know about it. And so the other advantage of this approach is that you can see here, we've got what we call an H tree. And instead of assigning column addresses in red here and row addresses in blue here, you know, which we then encode after we've selected the row and the column, here we are generating the bit of the X address, for example, you know, with this, this node here, if it reads an event from this, this pixel, then it just sends up a zero in front of that data or a one, and then this one sends a zero or a one and so forth. And so by the time you get up the tree, you've got all these bits that have been generated as part of the, uh, in parallel with the arbitration. Okay, so then you can basically solve a whole bunch of problems with this sort of, you know, what's called arbitration, but it's not really arbitration. We're still arbitra arbitrating here. It's just a better architecture where we are not driving these huge lines across the chip. Okay, it takes care of this race in the, in the raw pixels, match delays in the columns, poor scaling of the wide ores. And again, encoding addresses while you're arbitrating allows you to remove the encoder from the critical path and take care of races that occur in the, in the uh, arbitrary tree. So watch the full talk. If you have, you want to know more about this, I go through, through this all carefully, but I'm just going to show you some results, you know, in the last two, three minutes we have here. So this is the chip that we did, a two by two millimeter chip called Braindrop. Um, we are using this much of the core area to implement uh, in 28 nanometer FDSOI, this ST's process, 4,096 spike in neurons, 1,024 synaptic filters. It wasn't actually designed as an event imager, it was designed to actually do, uh, you know, implement these sort of uh, spike in neuron networks. And there's weight memory and some additional memory for buffering events and you know, reconfiguring the connectivity between pools and so forth. But the part that you're interested in here relevant to this talk is here we call what people used to call metapixels, now have 16 spike in somers and four synaptic filters. You can see the, the uh, somers here and the synapses here uh, because the capacitors for filtering, uh, they, they, they take up more room. And just to walk you through this, so now if you actually put back the metal layers, you start seeing some structure here that suggests that if you remove everything but those two levels of metal we're using to route events in this bit serial fashion, you can see we have two H trees. And you know, one of them is basically has these sort of six levels that it's a four RE tree. So it needs six levels to be able to handle uh, four to the six to be able to handle 4,096 spiking neurons. And then there's a receiver that's sending events into the, you know, spikes into the synaptic filters and also programming some local memory we have in there, which so has to address those 1024 guys. And so this is showing you the, uh, you know, the 4 tree here with six levels for the transmitter, five levels for the receiver. And the way that we are communicating is we are using one mm -hmm. or four encoding, which tells us which of the four daughters or children we are, we are to send the, 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 the event to or to encode the event from. And then we've got some extra signals handshaking for the start and the end of the packet. And so you can see, get some ideas. So all this circuitry down here is implementing that H tree. And in these uh, you know, lower level nodes of the trees are sitting here dedicated inside the metapixel. And then the rest of the levels of the tree are routed up that secretary is placed in these cutouts. And then we route that together, like you saw when you were looking at the metalization. Sorry, so this to, interrupt, is... sorry to interrupt one minute. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, David. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'll, I'll be good in a minute or so. 
And so, um, so this is just showing you the process in simulation from the extracted layout where this, this uh, a neuron in this pixel down here, actually two of them requested down here and we are not pipelining. So we have to generate all these bits sequentially up the tree and so on and so forth. And you can see it here at the top of the tree where we just communicate with the root, we cycle very fast. And then as we wait for more bits to come out uh, from lower and lower levels, we cycle a little bit slower. But even then we're able to transmit 23.5 uh, nanosecond cycle time, which is about 40 something uh, events per second. And so we've proven this concept in actual silicon and it's like rock solid. There's no uh, flaking at all. It's fully delay insensitive. We're not making any time and assumptions. We're not uh, cutting any corners. And you know, each, each uh, link is just one sender, one receiver. So that's fully delay insensitive. And so this is an app to transmit on the order of 650 events per second in a 2v6 by 2v6 array. And there's room for, there's a lot of room for growth. This is like where we were back in the 90s with the early versions of the Abitur design, which improved tremendously. I think there's a lot of potential here because now we have all this area next to the, the neurons to route stuff. So there you can, you can watch the full talk for, for more about the prospects for this approach. And I would just uh, like to thank uh, ONR and Green Meta AI Labs for funding and acknowledge Crystal Posh for privacy uh, video that I didn't get the chance to show. You can watch it in the, uh, in the full talk. And this is the citation for the paper. And this is the GitHub with all the, uh, you know, HDL for the, for the design. Thank, so, you, thank very, you. Thank you very much. Uh, I ask the third speaker, Ralph, uh, I think coming. I'm here. Okay. Uh, I suppose we see the calendar, not the presentation. I'm sorry, say again? We see your calendar, but not the presentation. Oh, yes, right, because I think Kobena is still. Uh, I, I stopped, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we Kobena, we know all your schedule now. All your schedule now. We're going to lunch tomorrow, man. Right? Yeah, my, my schedule is pretty relaxed, yeah. I see you have a Jedi faculty team. That seems quite intriguing. <laughs> it's called for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Oh, okay. That's yeah. a sexy oh, name. <laughs> That's important. Can you guys see um, the front page? Yes. Yes, sure. Okay. Wonderful. So um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me, and thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of these spike learning um, saliency modeling that we've been that we've been doing. Um, this um, oops, you shouldn't have gone there. Um, this um, this talk is a work uh, that my student Khalid uh, Abu Mary is doing, and I'm just trying to be Khalid and explain the cool stuff that he's working on. So some of you may know that uh, you know, for the past few years, I've been um, you know, very much involved with. Um, Ernst Niebuhr and uh, Rudy van der Heijf and trying to understand how we understand objects that we look at, and why our eyes are pulled um, into certain directions and look at certain things. Uh, typically, basically, that means that we have these, um, what we refer to as a proto-object uh, based saliency model, which starts off with some kind of retinal model, which has intensity, color, um, motion, um, uh, information that then goes to a V1 model that uh, breaks these um, uh, this data into orientation, into edge, into um, into texture, um, uh, disparity, and so on. And then there's a layer that uh, represents more what happens in V2 and V4, which has a competitive border ownership um, representation, and then ultimately a grouping approach that puts um, the saliency. Um, uh, marker, if you will, on the object in the scene that is most likely to grab the attention of, of um, the algorithm, right? So we we try to mimic as much of what we know about biology, and we try to implement that in um, you know with uh, computation. Basically, these are MATLAB models that we are running. This is not hardware in this particular example. Um, so typically, then what you need to do then you, need, you start off. Whoops, why is this moving forward on its own accord? Hold on a second, there we go. You start off with some image. Um, you have had uh, some humans 
watch these images and you come up with a with a gaze a map, you know, where do people look? And that's what this second image here is. And what we then do is our model tries to predict what the humans are going to look at, right? And the correspondence between these two images are what tells us how well we're doing. So this is all good and well, uh, and everything that's been done so far has been basically videos, right? But what we wanted to do is try to do the same thing, but now with um, spike data. Um, the question is, what drags our eyes when we look at spiking data? So for that, we, we were um, fortunate to be um, uh, allowed to use this data set from Prophecy, which corresponds to two particular scenes uh, where, um, let's see here whether this will run. Okay, why is it not running? I don't know why the top one is not running, okay. Anyway, it's essentially just the data that uh, one corresponds to an uh, a car driving through the city and the other one corresponds to a, um, uh, a camera, it is camera sitting on the side of the road and watching um, the uh, uh, motorway as it goes by. So we wanted to basically then try to build a saliency model that, that would use this back data. So one of the front parts of your saliency model is this spatial temporal filters that are either part of your, you know, basically your retinal model, or at least at the very early stages of your, of your saliency model. And one couple of ways you can construct this is basically to say, look, you know, I know what I'm looking for. I know I'm look, I like vertical lines, horizontal lines, maybe some diagonal lines, these other different oriented filters, and, um, but now oriented in space and time. So there's motion embedded within it. Um, and I could handcraft it, uh, meaning that I basically use something like the wall filters and there you go and I, and I can make my models um, run with those types of, of, of inputs. Or I can develop a learning approach where I'm basically gonna say, look, the data itself should, should dictate what the models um, of the filters, the switch of filters should be. And then the question is, how do you learn these, these filters on data that is continuously streaming? Uh, because we know that as you start learning things uh, on uh, real life learning, uh, you tend to lose information over time, right? Because the, um, the thing that may have reinforced a particular um, uh, special temporal filter may not exist later on in, in, um, in your video sequence. So how do you prevent catastrophic um, forgetting? How do you prevent um, the, you know, how, how do you keep the relevance of the filters that you actually have left? So for that, we basically use an idea that came out uh, of... Uh, Joshua Vogelstein's lab at Hopkins. Um, is, he refers to it as uh, lifelong learning, which essentially has a set of competitive ideas or collaborative ideas where you basically um, talk about, you know, what is, you know, what has happened recently in your in your data stream, um, your event stream. What are, what kinds of things do you prefer? And that's your recency um, estimate, if you will. What kinds of things do you want to keep uh, no matter what's going on in the scene? So maybe you always care about keeping tracks of where all the cars are so I don't get hit by cars. So that would be a robustness estimate. Um, and then the other thing maybe um, uh, like a relevance estimate, which is, look, I only care about red cars. So I want, I would ignore everything else. So that is something else that can be imposed on top of your learning of your filters so that what your filters that sticks out at the end of your learning process would be those that would be, you know, hopefully, um, you know, relevant to your job, um, uh, robust to the various changing um, data streams that's coming in, and also as some top-down control over what you want to do. And uh, you can look at the paper, uh, uh, you can look at some of the algorithms a little bit later on um, as we go along. So. From there, we can basically learn different kinds of filters at different resolutions and different depths of, um, of computation. What happens is that there are some, um, some filters that tends to stick around and, and are tuned to basically, if you could say, the more repeated aspects of the scene. And those are usually at the top right, uh, top left hand corner of these, uh, of these arrays. Um, and those will happen to have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, variability and show up very rarely are those that are at the bottom right-hand corner of the two different um, 
set of, uh, of filter models, right? And what the top one, uh, like the top left-hand corner of filters essentially track is, is as I said, things that are always, you know, as part of your data stream, part of your event stream. So it could be, you know, just cars in general could be a filter that would be seen by the one on the top uh, left. But if there's a guy one time walking around and, you know, scratching his head, that might be seen only by the filters that are specifically tuned to a particular event that is very rare that happen, or a particular group of events that come in very rarely and can be, um, uh, yeah, uh, can be detected by those types of filters. So then the question was, all right, if I have those types of filters at my front end of my saliency model, how do I, um, you know, show these two examples, right? One that is triggered by events that happens a lot and one that's triggered by events uh, that happened very rarely. So what we did, we basically had a hypothesis and the hypothesis was that if I've been, you know, looking at these, um, um, these events um, uh, images for a long time, then I'm basically a experienced observer. I know what to expect. So I tend to be less interested in things that I've seen many times. Maybe I, I care more about what's going on in the background over there instead of all these cars going back in the, in the front. So those would be referred to as an experience observer. An inexperienced observer would be the guy that first takes a look at these images and they're looking everywhere. They're tracking all the different objects. And what we did is we basically gave um, these videos, we piped these videos through a, um, a headset um, and we had, uh, you know, Khaled has been looking at his videos ad nauseum um, and tracked his eyes movement and had him just watch those videos. And then another person in the lab who had never seen these videos before, at least had not seen it very often, and we tracked um, his or her uh, eyes. Um, and then we basically asked which one of these two um, filter models predicts their eye movements uh, the best way. So the top one would be what a, an ex, um, like basically the experience observer would, would, what they would look at. The bottom one here would be what the inexperience observer would look like, would look at. But the, the, the data that really captures, you know, a hypothesis, if you will, is that little confusion matrix on the bottom here. Basically it shows that the green uh, filter um, is uh, one that basically tracks the inexperience observer more as we had um, as we had predicted, uh, whereas the um, the red filter um, uh, tracks the experience observer more because, as I said, we you know, the experience observer may be more interested in looking at um, at the nuance in the in the video streams. So, so uh, but, for the time is running. Yep. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm about to I'm about to be done. Um, so just to explain to you what the video is showing, the big the big dot, the big yellow dot, that's the actual eye um, fixation point. Whereas the little green and little um, uh, red dots are what the algorithm is predicting what the, where the location should be. So just to finish up, move on to the next. So basically what we're doing now is that, you know, we, there's not in, there's no, as far as I know, there's no saliency database that is key, uh, that, that uses spike images as input and have had humans observe them and a, you know, a saliency um, database be constructed for them. So we are in the process of doing that with a HTC Vive because it, it takes out a lot of the variables in the psychophysics experiment and make sure that everybody basically looks at the same scene in the same way and makes life a lot easier for collecting data of that sort. Um, and our initial hypothesis seems to be working out uh, based on this learning of these uh, filters uh, dynamically. And uh, yeah, and we're hoping that as we build this database more, you know, more broadly, it will be something that will be available to the community, of course, and it'll be something that will be able to try out a lot of different types of uh, CNC algorithms upon it. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very Papers. much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker, uh, Ignacio, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, here, hold on. So I'm going to share the screen. Let me know if you, you can see it from the screen. Yeah, can yeah, we can see it. Great, so thank you very much, Davide. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to the organizers. So 
I'm Nacho Tegaray. I'm with the Vision for Robotics Lab at the APH Zurich, and I'm going to be talking about our research towards asynchronous slam with event cameras. So event cameras are a, really offer a, a unique opportunity for robust perception and robotic applications, just because they react really fast to changes. They have HDR capabilities, and they consume really low power. But for us, the most important aspect of it is that they produce an asynchronous and a sparse output, right? So this implies that there is no notion of time discretization. And there is only capturing of things that are changed in the scene. This, in principle, is a disadvantage, as in we cannot apply any of the traditional computer vision algorithms to these sensors. But to us, this is more of an opportunity to design novel algorithms that are specifically tailored for this kind of sensing modality. So in particular, we are going to be tackling the SLAM problem. Uh, in part, we are going to take as a reference a traditional feature-based pipeline in which you will take some images and then detect some features in those images, apply some data association to produce tracks, and then later on get for a state estimation uh, stage in the visual backend. If we take this into an um, um, event-based approach in an event-driven pipeline form, the initial point will be now a single event. So this single event represents a small intensity change at a pixel. This will lead to a change on the feature set that we are considering and each time, maybe removing, maybe adding some of them. Um, we are, consequentially, also the tracks of each of the features has to change at least a little bit. All these changes build up to a incremental change on the post, for instance, or the local map that we are considering. We are going to be talking about different works that we have done in this area, specifically about the visual front end. And you have to keep in mind that we are doing event by event processing, just each of the events uh, individually. And all of this that we are going to show is meant to be running real time, CPU only in a single thread. So at least to some extent. Talking directly for feature detection, we can go to asynchronous corner detection. So keep in mind that the events obviously are getting generated around the edges of the scene. And we are using a surface of active events uh, in this first work that we publish. At the end of the day, we, we are just accumulating the latest timestamp of each of the events into uh, the pixel that it was generated to. Then what happens is that every time a new event comes, then we are checking what's the local surface uh, of active events. How does it look? And based on this, we can classify this incoming event as a corner or not a corner. The important thing is that we are doing this as soon as the events are generated. So, there is no latency between the generation of the events and the classification of the of the this event as a corner or not. And you can see that from the initial uh, stream of events that is already quite sparse, we can get into a more sparse, uh, even sparse um, event stream of corners. Most importantly, is that we are still inheriting the temporal resolution of the original stream. So compared to a normal frame-based detection feature detection pipeline, in which you will face gaps between these detections in the image plane. In an ideal world, at least, the event-driven detection will be forming a continuous set of detections in the image plane. And we can exploit this to get a um, really nice and simple data association based on nearest neighbors. If we translate this into a temporal uh, space, this simple data association forms some kind of a graph or made of small trees that we can further process in an offline stage to retrieve the feature tracks. This will be the results that we see in high speed. And this method for, uh, works fairly well, even despite the simplicity of the data association. But obviously, this is limited in its application uh, for more complex scenes, yeah. where the corner detections are really more cluttered, and the data association is not as simple, or just simply you are missing too many detections. And then obviously, this method is going to be not so good on that. But just to summarize this initial work that we presented, it was about corner detection, really efficient, um, and some kind of really simple data association that we are going to actually improve in the next work I'm going to talk to you about. So in this second work that we published in uh, 3, 3BD, uh, you have to understand we, we start with the corner events already detected by whatever corner detector you want to choose, but at, at event rate. And then we are going to, again, look at the surface of active events uh, surrounding this incoming corner event. But instead of using for classification, we are going to use it for a lightweight descriptor, something that we can compute on the fly really efficiently. And then we're going to still do some kind of um, data association based on proximity. 
So you can see that we are growing some kind of a tree, but in this case, some of the data associations can be early rejected based on the descriptor distance. Each of these trees will represent a feature itself, but sometimes the branches will indicate that maybe there is a possibility that the feature has moved to a different direction. This is, we are keeping a multi-hypothesis approach to the features. And at some point we have to decide what happened with these branches. Is it a, is it a feature in its own or it's something that we have to discard? And this will be based on um, consistency. So with this, you see here, this is the full graph with all the branches as they are generated. Again, real time for, for this specific uh, scenario because it's really efficient. Um, from this graph, we can process now on the fly online a set of tracks that are um, checking for consistency and based on this descriptor distance and so on. So with this approach, we get way longer tracks than with the previous approach just because the data association is more reliable. And if we look at the layer set of feature tracks, we can still infer the motion of the camera out of this. So to summarize, we have proposed a really simple local descriptor uh, for these Kone events. We have some multi-hypothesis data association approach and we can retrieve the tracks uh, in an online process in contrast to the previous approach that we did. The problem here is that we are continuously relying on corner, detector, uh, corner detections in order to feed the tracking data, right? And then we are linking the performance of the tracker to the performance of the detection. And this is a, in general a bad idea because if your detections are not so good, and your tracking cannot perform good, even if it's a really good algorithm. Our next, next work is actually dealing with this and moving directly to track on raw uh, data, on raw events. So consider that we have a feature and this feature is defined by a state. That is the X, Y pixel coordinates, orientation maybe. And then we are going to consider a window of latest events surrounding this feature. So from this, the combination of both things, we can define a projection, what we call the model. Um, and this projection is to be matched to a template that we are regenerating only from the events or on the go, on the fly, okay? Not something that is pre-computed according to some alignment score. All of these elements mm, form together an optimization problem in which we are trying to optimize for the best feature state according to some alignment score function of choice that combines the template with respect to the window of latest events. The problem is that we have to solve this at two millions of events per second. Well, nowadays even more, bigger events. Um, but this is obviously uh, infeasible to do for real time applications or robotic applications. But if we take a closer look at the problem uh, and we understand that the event stream is continuous or almost continuous in the information that it's providing, if we were to solve this problem, the optimization problem every single time, this feature track will describe a continuous trajectory in the image space. And we can actually exploit this the same way that we exploited it uh, in the previous works. So we're going to take the first initial state as the current optimal state, and we're going to spawn a set of hypotheses surrounding it. And what we are going to do is actually only uh, evaluate the solution in, on those hypothesis, uh, or hypothetical states. On those hypothetical states, the evaluation is really cheap or way cheaper than solving the optimization problem every single time. And when we go to a new hypothetical optimal state, we spawn a new set of hypothetical states surrounding it. This is a much, much more efficient way to deal with the problem. Although the result, it would be in a discretized state, we can always revert back to the continuous formulation if necessary for better precision. The problem is that, yeah, uh, we need to still do this at event rate. Keep in mind that we are processing event by event in this case. And when we are re dealing with real data, then this is the velocity that it has to reach. And this is not so simple because every time a new event comes, we are changing the template, we are changing the event window. And in the initial approach, we need to compute the alignment score from scratch every single time. In a second iteration of this paper, we decided to propose a new incremental rule that allows you to compute the incremental alignment score based on the previous alignment score and just the contribution of the latest event. So more in a event by event processing uh, uh, fashion. With this, we have like way better uh, tracking than the, with the previous method. And we still have super uh, good efficiency and we can do high speed tracking as well. Um, and compared to other methods from the state of the art, for instance, this is from Sue, I think he's uh, among the listeners here. Uh, you can see that previous methods or most of the majority of the methods still do some kind of batches and they process the data as in frames or artificial batches and they create tracking iterations, right? Essentially, we are reverting back to some kind of 
frame-like processing. In our case, we are advocating for a fully asynchronous tracking method that pro profit directly from the way that the data is generated. And you can update the tracks exactly the moment that the events has been generated without any delay. So just some final remark, oh, well, no, sorry, for, so these last works that we were uh, showing, they are about tracking, but only on raw, on raw events. Um, we have achieved that to have real-time capabilities with the last changes. We believe that all of these elements already put us in a really good state to address the state estimation from an even driven perspective, but this is ongoing research so far. So just to conclude some remarks, um, my personal opinion on this is that processing event by event or in, in an event driven fashion is the natural way to go with event cameras. And in this regard, I'm kind of aligned with Riyadh, uh, his school of thought. Uh, I think exploiting it this way is the way that we can actually exploit explicitly the sparsity and synchronicity of the data. It also reduces a little bit the assumptions as in trying to tune for the motion of the speed or the amount of texture that we are going to expecting to see. Uh, but the drawback here is that we have to be really, really careful about designing the algorithms. So they run efficiently. They are enough to run in real time. They are robust enough because we are incrementally adding only one event at each time. And they are scalable because now we are facing that every single year we have higher and higher resolutions, right? So we want, need to keep it scalable. So that will be all from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, Guillermo, I think uh, we, have, uh, we have finished the time for this lot. I don't know if we have time for questions. Let me know if I have a time for uh, one question. Yeah, I think we could uh, just move the shift and use these 20 minutes and then we start 10 minutes late and yeah, make a shorter poster session. I think we are fine. Okay, so uh, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, uh, they already asked where the, uh, the last one from Ignacio that is not asked is that uh, is the state estimation also synchronous? So the part that we have shown so far, it's about the visual front end, right? The visual front end is all the words that we have proposed is about tracking and so on, right? In that regard, the state of the tracker, it is asynchronous, but I suspect that Costas is aiming to, to get an answer from the backend, right? Like how would you actually do the processing on post estimation and map estimation? This is the part that is a little bit more tricky these days, and we are trying to figure out how to do it in, a, in the best way possible, right? We have seen already works actually from Costas about the Kanban filter and so on, uh, but there is still a, a lot of flavor that we can add to this and as I said, ongoing research for sure. Okay, there is another question for Ignacio. Sorry, they asking if uh, since uh, in the stream the appearance uh, change, they said it is very complicated to do a data association. We can uh, rely on this kind of tracking events. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, and I will argue that the most complicated part for these algorithms are meant to be computer vision approach, as in try to estimate the motion and so on. Is that we have realized for so many years on the fact that every representation that we are faced to is static, right? That in this case, what we are seeing from an event camera is not only the static, it's also part of the history of what you have seen. You encode the motion on top of it. And it is true, it, I completely agree with this question. It's like the most challenging part is actually deriving a, um, how to say, a static representation of what you are trying to match. And this we do, for instance, in the tracker with this kind of template that evolves over time. And it's required to fixate somehow this. I think this is connected to what Robert was doing in his talk, right? How are you going to come back to somehow a, a frame right? that you can rely on, right? But generating this data from uh, event data is way, way more complicated, out of question. OK, there are other questions for Ignacio, but I would like to ask something also to the other uh, speaker. And in particular, I have a question because in the first panel, we discussed about the, the idea that we need the temporal resolution. But uh, the trend now is that the resolution of the camera is growing. And so also the, the event rate is growing uh, exponentially. Now we are talking about one giga events. I saw that the, uh, OmniVision is presented the two megapixel event based camera. And uh, how, what is, what is the, the approach? I mean, I'm talking uh, also for Bernabe that is working with the convolution neural network or uh, Cabena that is presenting the arbitrary. How do you uh, face this tra trade between uh, the, the, the increasing resolution, the low latency, and, and the low, la low power that we discussed before. If you are facing this kind of problem, your research, of course. 
Yes, and in, in, in our case, what we do is, is we just try to increment the number of uh, interconnection buses between the different uh, computing modules. For example, inside an FPGA, you, you, you can have many convolutional modules on, that, that work independently, but they connect to neighbors with uh, communication buses and, and then the more you have distributing also the traffic you know? and you can do this at, at the FPGA level at the network on chip level or at the at yeah the but uh, this means that also the FPGA should be more powerful mm, well not necessarily it, it depends okay. on the complexity of, of the modules that, that you that you manage to synthesize okay okay mm. Okay, uh, so there are another question for Ignacio. I'm sorry because the people are chatting. <laughs> it's nice because it's very interactive workshop. Uh, how does your template method handle, so for Ignacio, how does your template method handle template when the motion is parallel to line in the template? And so do not generate many uh, any events. Do you update yes. the template? So, uh... I mean, obviously we have to find a uh, trade-off with this, right? If we look at works, for instance, um, from Gerig et al, right? Uh, they will use a template from the images and this is a static, right? And then you have the edges that you are not going to see that are already encoded in your template. In our case, we cannot rely on that and then we have to adapt to it. There is a way that this template that is initially generated is not as we saw it in the video, right? It evolves. So it has to adapt to those changes. And maybe sometimes you are not seeing the edges as they are initially generated, but you have a way to adapt to things that are happening. Um, this way you can update the template on the, on the fly. This leads to a variety of other issues out of question, but it's a compromise that we have to adapt on the fly, for sure. Okay. Um... I don't have any other question, I suppose. There is another question about for uh, Kobina about H3, but he's as worried about the chat. Uh, I have one. I have one. Uh, oh, so in this session, we have two tracking. One is kind of handcrafted in uh, using time surfaces at the beginning, and then more like these templates from Ignacio. But we also have in the session the learned spatial temporal filters to do some saliency. Um, maybe I kind of missed that but is Ralph uh, are you also tracking uh, so is the saliency used for detection and then you track it or is uh, all a single model or do you think you can combine the trackers from Ignacio well, that's completely different this hypothesis that he's using so no it's completely different in the sense that we we are not creating tracks right we are basically just saying where is the cluster of, uh, of events that came in that matched a particular property in the spatial temporal filters that, that uh, are, are sitting up front, right? So there's the, the hot like temporal surface that basically does the clustering that brings you to a, um, to a handle, um, which becomes essentially like, hey, this group, this group of, um, of events are moving together, yes, in that sense of, of a track, but we're not keeping you know, we're not keeping those relationships, right? We're just basically saying, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is, right? And now the question is, when us as humans and we're looking at these same cluster of spikes, did we look at them or did we look at something else? Or did we just don't care, right? And can you then do the matching of the two? And there are times when you can kind of very well predict what the humans will look at. And there are times where, you know, it seems like we're looking at little nuances in the background. And those are the things that we're trying to uh, distinguish between the two, um, in the different events, uh, different uh, filters. Does that make thank sense? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, maybe I can comment a little bit, but I think that maybe it's not as far as both of us approaches seems to be, right? Because at the end of the day, if we think about a method I just proposed, it's also tracking by detection of sort, right? And in your case, it would be more of a classification problem. Uh, we started the same with uh, some kind of a classification and is this matching this class of sort? And we just migrated it to a way that we can transition in an event-based fashion. But in reality, it might not be that far apart, but obviously we need a bridge between the two approaches. 
but don't you also provide some form of a, of a vector? I mean, when I think of tracks, I think a vector associated with each, you know, with each centroid, so to speak, right? That yes. it tells you where yeah. it's going. Yeah. But you do that, right? But we don't, right? We're it's not, implicit. We're not it's, it's somehow implicit, right? If you think of the problem, like the continuity of the problem, you can say, okay, this has happened really close, so you suspect that it's going to be the same thing, right? In your case, if you have a cluster, and a unique cluster in the image, and you see a unique cluster later on, you are going to assume that it's the same one if it's really close, right? So right in time, close exactly. in time, close in special time, yeah, special. Time. Exactly, and then it's rather implicit. Obviously, we have the vectors and so on, but it is might not be as far apart as it seems initially. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'll have to you know pay attention to your paper a little bit more and see how we can bridge it. Okay. I don't know if there are other questions. So to other, uh, okay. <laughs> Come and ask me on the chat, it's okay, cool. Uh, okay, and I, I don't read the, the ask, I mean, the chat they can be followed by people. Uh, I, if yeah. there are other, I don't know if there are other questions. <laughs> Otherwise we can continue and go on. No, no, it wasn't a question. I was just answering your, your earlier question about scalability of the H3 going yeah. to bigger uh, imagers. And, you know, by basically going parallel and pipelining, um, basically, you know, operating the various levels of the tree uh, concurrently, um, we can get to some like half a giga event per second with the, with the current, based on our current uh, measurements. Because uh, in practice, uh, from my experience, uh, what you can have theoretically with, uh, with a one megapixel sensor, you can arrive up to three giga event per second if you want. But this has become a very, very difficult to use. Yeah, I think to get there, there's extra tricks, just a whole new generation. But you know, I'm not going to get into that because that's <laughs> okay. no, no, it's very starting, speculative. It's starting to be very problematic. I, I, I like to build stuff before I talk. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. This is cool. One question okay. though, Kobena. Yes. Uh, Kobena, I have a quick question. Um, so in memories, don't they use these kinds of um, of mechanisms to get? like to really dense memory to you know to route uh, data in and out of it a tree yeah like, like a way no, of uh, no they still have row and column lines right still doing row and columns I thought yeah, we have no row and column lines uh, uh, none i have a question related to representations i think stepan is also writing about it um he writes he asks what should the representation be from the event based sensor should event camera output some higher level representation like bio retina. And uh, I think what one can see from the work of Ignacio and his PhD and also some previous talks and the school from, I guess, from, from France that people are using time surfaces, but I see that Ignacio is not using time surfaces towards the end of his PhD. Um, there are many trackers that are using these time surfaces, but it seems that now he's moving away from this representation. So maybe we could talk about a bit about representation, which is a very interesting topic for computer vision. Um, I mean, if you want, I can start with that. I I think that the, the, it's a double-edged sword in, in the sense that surfaces of the basic type, right? You will have um, surfaces that just accumulated information and update it. You have time surfaces that decay and so on they are meant to provide a static representation of what's happening, right? Uh, we also propose, propose our own way of sorting it and so on. The things that you need to, we are so used to look for static representations because they were used in CNNs and so on, right? So in that regard, I wanted to be a little bit more free from that because you are taking some assumptions from it as in how much time do you have to accumulate information or how much can you rely on this, right? And how you cope with the, uh, coping with the noise. I think they are necessary at this stage, but I believe that eventually we will evolve from that uh, towards something that comes more natural to the actual uh, event itself, right? Like more to the point cloud and less to the image itself. But that would be only my take here. <laughs> so let me also add something to that. Uh, our experience with time surfaces in uh, self motion sequences like the prophecy or the DSEC or the MBSEC uh, is that uh, this is there really you can hardly see like a structure unless you have a very strong uh, like noise reduction before that much stronger than 
what Dot Toby has done or some like saliency like the one, I don't know if it was uh, Bernabe, but uh, the, in the order of like 1% probably reduction, and then you can see something. But if you actually want to learn the time surfaces using some optical flow signal, then you can see them much clearly. But without any supervision, I think for self-motion sequences, it's really very hard to build. I don't know if anybody, I mean, I'm asking everybody if they have, if anybody has done something a, like a time to collision or a focus of expansion computation using time services. Not using time services, no. So I, I think it, it, graph it convolutional well. networks to segmentation use really the time surfaces over a very long time. I mean, uh, still you need to you need some reduction of the signal at the beginning uh, with the six forty by four eighty with the new sensors. This is really you cannot build the graph. No, you have to downsample. Yeah. Maybe there are mm -hmm. better techniques, of course, downsampling. Yeah heavy down sampling before you start. Mm -hmm. I, I think the saliency work is a spot on for everything, not, that, not just for a salient region, but also for saliency in XYT. Right, really the time surfaces do carry information about a little time window too, which is characteristic and lets, um, right. for occlusions especially is great, carries information that we can't see instantaneously. I'm seeing cross each other, move on top of each other. It's interesting that now we have moved to these sensors that they can capture edges. And we were thinking that it was sufficient for a sparsity, right? And we face the situation now that we are pushing the boundaries so far that the, the edges are too much information already. And we have to don't sample it or summarize it even further, right? But just because we are pushing for higher, higher event rates, right? At the end of the day, I think that it's a fight that, I mean, I think that the work in saliency is amazing because we are now focusing on what's important from the scene to be processed, right? Maybe in the future, and there are ways on words, we will have to be working on summarization, as in what will look at a stream into something more compact, but represents the same data, right? The same way that we were talking in the past about um, Gaussian blurs and trying to go to a scale uh, space for normal images. Yes, that's where I would put it too. You want uh, to explore the events at multiple time scales, not just instantaneously. That's where the surfaces come in. Okay, uh, I suppose, uh, Guillermo, we have the time to start this, the, the, the break probably now. Uh, no, we will move then to the DSEC competition. Okay. We, still, okay. we still have three minutes. Okay, so there was another question about for Ignacio from Julia. Have you tried uh, tracking the object moving in 3D? Or where can the, the tracking method deal with occlusion? So at the moment, we are the problem is as simple as tracking a, a patch in the image space, right? Trying to cope a little bit with this kind of dynamics and try to avoid the motion trail of the problem. So can I, can I track a 3D uh, objects? Yes, it can, right? As a patch, at least. Obviously, if it changes the appearance in 2D changes too much, it will not work, right? It could be adapted easily. But it, and also the about the occlusions, well, it will depend, right? But uh, in general, as it is, it cannot do it because you expect that the appearance is not going to change. The same way that a KLP tracker, you cannot handle something that is arbitrarily changing, right? But it doesn't matter in mind if, if you have a model for this to be projected to, to 2D, then it should be uh, feasible to do. Uh, and regarding the occlusions, well, we have seen already a bunch of works already on graph segmentations, uh, ways to de detach things that is in front of the object, and so on. I think that that could be a nice extension to the whole thing. Thank you, Mr. Okay, uh, Guillermo, you have a question for uh, Bernabe? Yeah, I, had, I think it's Stefan and I had a question. So uh, yeah, for please. Bernabe, uh, he mentions yeah. that sensitivity goes high, but 
the dynamic range. The dynamic range, it's intra-scene dynamic range. So you still have the full dynamic range. You, it, it, the sensor still works for low light and, and very strong sunlight, but not simultaneously on, on the same scene because you, uh, we had to add some, like, uh, like in normal cameras, some adaptation mechanism to adapt to the light. So for the same scene, you will be limited. It's due to the, because we introduced diode connected uh, NMOS transistors and, and the voltage adds, and then the, the power supply rail will limit. But if uh, we have access to some technology that has like zero voltage, uh, threshold voltage for the, for the diodes, then this would not be a problem. Mm. But that would be a special technology, not, not the standard CMOS technology. Thank you. I think there is a follow-up question by Davide. Uh, yes, um, there was a comment from Toby, I see. And uh, the question is, can this trade-off be controlled somehow? I suppose it's calling about trade-off between the, the dynamic range and the sensitivity. Yeah, it is similar problem, yes. Okay, so I suppose that the panel is finishing now. So we can go with the next. Uh... Yeah, thank you very much to all our speakers in session two. And now yes. we move on to the results of Thank the you. competition from Matthias.